Okay, so the equation for the pressure now is ddx of h cube by 12 dp dx is equal to the rate of settling v which was just v naught right which which is v in our problem <clears throat> now doing one integration again i have a constant upon h cube okay but now uh, going to the geometry of my problem instead of imposing the outlet pressures at both ends i can impose outlet pressure at one end and uh, yes i can impose outlet pressure at one end and i can uh, say that there is symmetry at the center because of the obvious symmetry of the problem <coughs> so i can say that um, at x equal to 0 I know that dp dx must be equal to 0 so this immediately implies that c1 is equal to 0 so therefore dp dx is just 12 b0 by h cube x and then now I can integrate this again uh, from p at the outlet right to p at any position x within the layer So what I have is P at the outer region, which is a constant, minus P is equal to 12 B naught times integral. Now, the lower limit is X inside the thin region and the outer limit is the uh, X value at the outer boundary. So because I had uh, 0 at the center point and uh, X must go from minus L by 2 to plus L by 2, in scale form X goes up to half. Right? Or uh, for simplicity, I can say I can write x goes to 1. So x goes from 0 to 1, where my domain actually would go from minus L to plus L. So I can just say that this total length is 2L. Right? It doesn't change the fact that L remains the appropriate length scale here. Right? Of course, I could have had a factor of 4, but Again, these things are all within order of magnitude, so it doesn't really matter. But just for algebraic simplicity, I can say the domain is minus 1 to plus 1. So x goes from, so the integral is from x to 1. Again, I have my integral variable. Okay, and now uh, again, h cube has this uh, relatively simple parabolic form. B plus alpha S square. Okay, the whole cube. And now this in doing this integration again uh, should take you back to your uh, well eleventh uh, or twelfth standard integration. So a simple transformation to use here is m is equal to S square, in which case dm is two S ds, right? Or dm by 2 is equal to s ds and then the limits where s was going from x to 1 <coughs> the limits on m would go from x squared to 1 right and so then if i make this substitution you will see that i then just get an integral involving uh, a linear function of uh, s of course raised to the cube so then that integration can be done easily uh, once again, I leave the uh, uh, details to you and what you can show is that P is equal to P out minus the rate of settling B dot into 3 by alpha, which was the, remember the slope factor, 
I mean the coefficient of the parabola upon 1 upon b plus alpha x square the whole square minus 1 upon b plus alpha the whole square all right now you can see that uh, this is 3 okay so the first question to ask is is the pressure greater or smaller than the outer pressure we expect it to be greater right because remember you have to drain fluid from beneath the cylinder which means the pressure just below the cylinder should be greater than the outlet pressure only that way you have a pressure gradient uh, that can actually drive flow out from under the cylinder and you can see that is true here because uh, this denominator term right remember x goes from 0 to 1 <clears throat> so the maximum value of uh, this term is actually b plus alpha when x is 1 otherwise the denominator is actually smaller in this term therefore the overall magnitude of this term is actually larger so that this entire term is positive right but we know that b dot itself is negative and therefore minus b dot is positive and so therefore we know from here that p p is certainly greater than p out right? which is as it should be so it seems like the calculation at least the algebra is right okay so i now have the distribution of pressure uh, in terms of the rate of settling what i want to know is the force the force due to the fluid exerted as a consequence of this pressure so remember the argument i made earlier that because the pressure scales as one by epsilon the leading contribution to the force exerted on the by the fluid on the cylinder is just due to the normal pressure force so this force uh, if i consider it just to be the force due to the pressure in the lubrication region is 2 times integral 0 to 1 the pressure forces which remember act now in the unit normal uh, direction on the cylinder <coughs> times ds where s is the coordinate along this uh, profile of the cylinder right so remember let's say this is x sorry this is x right then the coordinate here is s tangent to the cylinder right so s is the kind of uh, arc link coordinate let's say along the cylinder such that ds square is equal to dx square plus dx square this you can see if i make a small triangle here and use Pythagoras theorem where this is dh this is dx and this is ds let me remove this s all right so this is what uh, this is sort of a line integral along the profile of the bottom cylinder where i'm integrating the pressure forces and the action of the pressure forces of course is always in the normal direction n hat okay now uh, more than this what i need is not only the total fluid forces i want specifically uh, the force due to the fluid in the y direction <coughs> right so the general force of course there can be forces in all directions we expect because of the symmetry that the forces in the x directions would cancel uh, but really what we want is only the vertical motion so what we want is the forces in the fluid acting in the y direction so to get that force i have to take the dot product of this factor dotted with ey all right so before i can i know pressure but i need to find n so for that you need to have a description of uh, this surface so i can say that the surface of the cylinder is given by a function uh, y minus h of x comma t equal to zero and the uh, unit normal then n is equal to minus grad f by mod grad f Right, which uh, then if you apply uh, 
I mean basic vector identities you'll see that it's minus ey taking this minus sign inside plus do x by do x ex right upon uh, we needed the mod of grad f right which is just one so the unit here is one the coefficient is one plus uh, do h by do x the whole square the whole to the power half So this is the unit normal. How do I know that the sign is correct? Remember, because I can have the unit normal either pointing uh, out of the cylinder or into the cylinder. Well, you can see that in the limit of the, reaching the center point, right? So uh, when you reach a center point where dh dx is equal to zero, the outward unit normal, which is what I need to find the force is just uh, minus ey. Right? So I know that this is the correct expression for the unit normal. <coughs> And therefore, if I now, uh, so the, the convention to take the outward unit normal goes all the way back to the derivation of our equations, where we said that the stress on a surface, remember from Cauchy's theorem, is n dot capital T, where this n is the outward unit normal to the surface. And then from here, if you take only the pressure contribution to capital T, you will get this expression. So this n has to be the outward unit normal to the surface on which you want to calculate the force acting uh, by the fluid on that surface. Right, because after all, it was this convention of using the outward unit normal that gave us the form of the pressure gradient minus grad P in the Navier Stokes equations. And so it's important to use the same unit normal here. Okay, but now if I take the dot product, you see if I take N dot EY, which is what I really need. To calculate the vertical force is just minus 1 upon 1 plus dou h dou x the whole square to the half. So I can substitute this in here but first I need to replace ds with dx and you can see that uh, I can do that directly from this transformation so I know that ds is Right, dx square plus dh square can be written as uh, dou h by dou x the whole square dx square right this is ds square and therefore ds must be equal to dx into 1 plus dou h by dou x the whole square the whole to the half right so if I now substitute ds as well as n dot e y into the integral, you'll see that these uh, uh, factors involving dh dx exactly cancel out. I just have minus left over, so you'll actually just get minus p. So again, the force on the fluid right, in the vertical direction is twice integral 0 to 1, right, with a minus sign, minus of p. Now, uh, before I proceed, actually, I could continue. So we, I can substitute this expression for P. But what we should recognize, of course, is what we really want is the overpressure P minus P out, right? Because this P out is there all over the cylinder. So this P out would just cancel off. In, in, in fact, I could have set it to zero. So what we really want is P minus P out, because that is the net force, the net pressure force. So, so this, this is, is actually, actually P, P minus, minus P, P out, out here. here. Right, so, so it's, it's just, just uh, p minus p out times dx, dx after these factors cancel out. And so, so now, now I can, I can make, make my, my substitution. substitution. So, so p, p minus p out, the minus signs cancel off from here. here. I just, just get uh, 6 times b dot. Six times b dot by alpha times 
वन अपॉन बी प्लस अल्फा एक्स स्क्वेर द होल स्क्वेर माइनस वन अपॉन बी प्लस अल्फा द होल स्क्वेर डी एक्स ओके सो ऑल दैट्स लेफ्ट नाउ टू कैलकुलेट द फोर्स इज टू डू दिस इंटीग्रेशन but now you see the this integral is easy to calculate but this integral uh, potentially poses problems right and you could of course you could get an exact solution in terms of arc tan but that's not really helpful uh, uh, for us uh, because we what we really want to do is i mean we could then have you then have to proceed numerically to understand the uh, uh, the way the uh, fluid settles <coughs> so what's more useful now is to remain consistent to the idea of uh, the long wave approximation where we know that this alpha is actually small right so we know that alpha is much less than 1 so for alpha much less than 1 i can simplify these two terms right so i can write this using the fact that alpha is much less than 1 in terms of the binomial theorem so i can take out a 1 by b square factor Right, I take out b from here because of the square. I get one by b square. That gives me one plus alpha by b x square. Uh, if I take it to the numerator, the whole is raised to minus two. And then if I use binomial theorem where alpha by b is small, I will get one minus two alpha by b x square. Right into minus. I can do the same here. I'll get one minus two alpha. by b right and then i have the other terms here 6b dot by alpha integration 0 to 1 right now this is a entirely straightforward integration in fact i can cancel out these minus terms so i just have simple Uh, polynomials which i can integrate twice and i can substitute the limits 0 to 1 right and what you would find ultimately which i will leave you to do is you get 8 times b dot by b q is the force due to the fluid remember this is acting in the e y direction Okay, so now finally we can because we have the force due to the fluid, we can now move on to calculating the sedimentation of the cylinder itself. Right, so a force balance on the cylinder, uh, neglecting inertial effects. Right, so the force balance in the e y direction. it would simply yield the following so i would get 8 times b dot by b q which is the force due to the fluid must be equal to minus the uh, fg where fg is a positive quantity force due to gravity so fg in this case is just the mass of the cylinder times the acceleration due to gravity and so now from this force balance you see i can okay so there are a couple of things here before we proceed so you see immediately that if i look at the force uh i mean yeah let's stop here so if you look at the force on the fluid uh this is the force exerted by the fluid on the cylinder i if the rate of settling is finite 
So for a finite rate of cycling b dot, you see that the force that gets exerted uh, goes off to infinity as b goes to zero. Right, so this is a startling result. What it tells us is that uh, as if you are trying to push down a cylinder towards a wall, right, at a finite rate b dot, then the force that has to be applied to overcome the resist the pressure of the lubrication layer must go to infinity uh, if you want to ever make contact. So this itself tells us that if you take a cylinder and you want the cylinder to go and crash against the wall with a finite velocity, you effectively have to impose an infinite force, uh, which seems basically to tell us that the cylinder it's impossible for the cylinder to contact the wall with a finite velocity. Now this seems to be in uh, contradiction to our normal experience, right? Where if you drop an object, uh, a sphere or a cylinder, let's say a cylinder, uh, on a surface in a fluid, you you actually see it going and hitting the wall with a what seems to be a finite velocity right? or it goes and hits in finite time and so right now we see that there is uh, the seeds of some sort of paradox uh, lying in this problem uh, but we will keep this aside for the moment and we will continue to try and calculate how b evolves in time so by using the fact that fg is now the fixed gravitational force i can try to solve this equation and what i have is db dt is equal to minus fg b cube over 8. Okay, so now this is a simple equation to solve, noting that b at time 0 is just 1 from our scaling. Right, and so what you will find ultimately, again, I leave you to solve this, is that b squared is equal to, or I can directly write it for b, is equal to 1 upon 1 plus fg by 8 into t, the whole to the half. And so now you see that if you ask the question, when does b become 0, right, or oh, so b becomes zero which means you have contact with the wall only at t going to infinity or in other words there is no contact in finite time it seems remarkable in fact if you plot b versus time right on a uh, using matlab or any other software you'll see that it goes down fast but then it seems to almost asymptote and it takes it takes longer and longer and longer and in fact the derivative of the approach of b to the wall uh, gets slower and slower as b goes to the wall in fact that's what we already knew from here right that the derivative with time is going to slow down and become small as b cube so that leads to this to the t to the half behavior which means that really it's going to take you an infinite amount of time for the cylinder to make contact with the wall or in other words for all practical purposes, the cylinder never touches the wall even though it is falling under gravity uh, if you are falling under a viscous fluid. Why? Because the calculation tells us the lubrication layer generates such high pressures right, as the gap becomes thinner and thinner or the pressure that it generates uh, to drive out the fluid, the viscous fluid from the bottom in this ever thinning gap becomes so large that it slows down the sedimenting sedimentation to a to, the, to a limit where you actually never make contact. Uh, you can now stop and ask, uh, is this peculiar, peculiar to a cylinder? Uh, what about a sphere? So you can treat the sphere problem in the same way, except you would now, uh, you could consider the f thin gap beneath the sphere in cylindrical coordinates, assuming axisymmetry. And then instead of x variations in x, you'll have variations in the radial coordinates. Of course, some other geometric factors will enter in when you do the integration of the forces and the lubrication equation has a slightly different form. Uh, but it, you, the lubrication theory can be done in exactly the same uh, manner. And in fact, it is given in the, the book by Gary Lee, right, the case for a sedimenting sphere. And what you will see there is that the force due to the fluid actually goes as B dot upon B. Whereas in this case of a cylinder, it went to b dot upon b cube. Here it goes up to some factor b dot upon b, which means that in that case, 
b actually will go as exponential of minus t uh, with the constant factor associated with the shape of course so here you see that in the case of a sphere also also takes infinite time right because the exponential function goes to zero only at t goes to infinity so in either case uh, in the case of a sphere also you take infinite time to make contact in the case of a cylinder in fact it's even stronger the resistance to sedimentation because you see the force uh, while the force here also goes to infinity it goes as b to the minus 1 here the force uh, required to make contact in finite time goes to b to the minus cube or the to the force associated with a constant uh, velocity at the wall or constant approach to the wall so the resistance due to lubrication due to the lubrication layer is even stronger in the case of a cylinder that that makes sense because the uh, smallest uh, gap zone in the case of a sphere it occurs at one point whereas in the case of a cylinder it occurs across an entire line in if you go of course instead of 3d to 2d cylinder if you go to 1d you will never have any sedimentation because the fluid is incompressible but that's an absurd sort of case okay so uh, this brings us to the end of this application but not to the end of uh, i mean our understanding of this problem right because what lubrication theory seems to tell us uh, is a result that contradicts our normal experience and in fact experiments right that this a sphere or a cylinder or in general any object right because uh, in the thin gap region you can represent any shape uh, as a parabola or some other cubic function and it won't really change this behavior so what it tells us is that uh, uh, a cylinder or a sphere settling to a wall actually never makes contact with the wall no matter how long you wait Whereas any real experiment will show you that you, you do have contact uh, not only in finite time but also you have bouncing uh, for larger cylinders. So how does one resolve this sort of contradiction or paradox? Well there are several uh, sort of uh, ways to reconcile these two things and I think the exact reason can vary from the details of your problem. So for example uh, some of the assumptions that the lubrication theory makes <coughs> which could be violated are the following one is a perfectly smooth object right? so in reality your cylinder or sphere could have some small roughness so roughness effects which can actually lead to slip so instead of having a perfect no slip boundary Right, you could have some slip occurring at the surface which would reduce the viscous stresses and thereby also reduce the magnitude of the lubrication pressure and so it's possible in those cases that once you get very very close to the wall the roughness becomes uh, i mean the the scale of the roughness becomes of the same order as the thickness in that case the lubrication effects also break down i mean the whole lubrication approximation breaks down right because this is the bottom wall and then this is your uh, the envelope of i mean the kind of nominal smooth cylinder but in reality it is rough right and the roughness looks like this when you have when the thickness of the roughness is of the same order as the gap right in that case the lubrication uh, approximation breaks down because the uh, uh, variations of the surface are no longer long wave right these are in fact short wave as it typically is for these roughness type of profiles so this could break lead to a breakdown of the lubrication idea that's one reason uh, this could be modeled as an effective slip but again i think very close to the wall even that idea would break down next you could have uh, a fact that in the very thin uh, region right at uh, sorry right so in a, in a very thin zone you could ultimately reach the point of uh, where the continuum the continuum approximation itself is invalid so if you go to extremely small thicknesses you might reach a you could ultimately reach a stage where you don't have enough uh, molecules to even apply continuum even before that even before that you will start having molecular forces 
forces coming into play like at the level of nanometers uh, even before you reach atomic scales or molecular scales you'll have molecular long range molecular forces like van der Waals right these can be both attractive and repulsive and so attractive molecular forces between your cylinder between your object and the wall even electrostatic forces can come into play and these could cause the surface the cylinder to make contact and to overcome the lubrication forces so molecular forces should come in to help you get finite contact uh, or the prediction from lubrication theory could be invalid because of roughness or in the final limit even if you don't have molecular forces you would ultimately have non continuum effects which would come in and again that would ultimately require you to revise your theory so uh, of course even the uh, the fact that the, we have treated this object to be perfectly non deforming will also not be valid because if the forces become so large the pressure forces even a metal ball can deform and so one needs to consider the elasticity and the deformation of the ball itself so finally one might have to consider the deformation of the object okay so you can see that there are several reasons why uh, in the ultimate uh, regime the prediction of lubrication theory uh, is not valid and in fact that is why it, the experiments do tell you that there is finite time as you expect and that it doesn't really take uh, I mean infinite time for contact but nevertheless uh, for a large portion of the sedimentation behavior this sort of prediction from lubrication theory will hold good uh, at the same point it is a caution, cautionary tale this problem is where you should always keep in mind the assumptions underlying the theory you are developing and always ultimately compare it uh, if not to experiment immediately at least to your experience and your understanding of other related problems and ultimately also to experiment all right so this brings us to an end of our uh, discussion of uh, the lubrication or long wave theory right we have seen how starting from the full two dimensional navier stokes equations we can obtain a set of equations uh, which are sort of a local uh, one dimensional flow but accounting for uh, two dimensional effects and pressure variations associated with variations in the thin gap uh, geometry of course these equations also require that the reynolds number is smaller at max order 1 so these equations now uh, form the basis to get approximate solutions to a whole class of problems that we had discussed in the beginning uh, we specifically took these equations further to show uh, how one typically solves these equations you use the fact that the pressure gradients in the x direction uh, are independent of y so you can integrate out the u equation immediately that gives us an approximation for the horizontal velocity which again takes the form of a locally unidirectional flow but which is sort of modulated by the variations in the gap thickness uh, this u can be used to calculate the spatially varying flow rate which can then be uh, plugged into the exact uh, flow rate conservation equation uh, which then gives us an equation for the pressure gradients provided you know how the wall deforms or how the walls move even if you don't this equation uh, after using the approximation for u would give us an evolution equation for the surface the free surface so in free surface problems this equation is actually what allows us to calculate how the surface evolves <laughs> and the uh, pressure variations would come from other boundary conditions for example uh, the pressure variations would be determined by capillarity effects in a thin film uh, or from hydro hydrostatic effects uh, in the case of a glacier okay but in the problems we considered we know dhdt and what is to be determined in fact is the pressure resulting from the relative motion of those uh, of the boundaries which we know or which are imposed and that can be done by solving this pressure equation the so called lubrication pressure equation and uh, we then went on so this is general we then went on to show how you can use identify the appropriate boundary conditions either for regular perturbation problems like uh, flow in a channel with uh, long wave modulations of the channel gap or channel thickness or also in singular problems where the thin gap region is only a part of the domain in either case we obtain simple boundary conditions at leading order which can allow us to get a close problem for the pressure the lubrication pressure we then applied it to two cases the slider block problem where we showed how if fluid is uh, 
driven into an increasingly narrow portion of the gap, we actually get a positive overpressure that pushes the up slider block up and in fact supports it. And then uh, we got the exact form for that pressure analytically. We then went on to consider flow or the sedimentation of a sphere towards a wall where the thin gap region is now dynamically evolving. Uh, but with suitable dimensional arguments, we were able to identify a thin gap region, apply a lubrication analysis, find again that an overpressure is developed that actually slows down the rate of sedimentation. In fact, to such an extent, we saw that it, uh, the lubrication pressure forces exerted on the sphere blow to infinity uh, if you had to have a finite rate of sedimentation as it, as it hits the wall. So instead, what happens is the forces remain finite, of course, but uh, the rate of settling gets smaller and smaller and smaller with time such that you would actually never make contact with the wall in finite time if lubrication theory were exactly true. Uh, but then of course we know that there are several reasons why uh, the lubrication theory can fail in the ultimate uh, long time uh, behavior and therefore you could have finite contact. So now uh, these lectures I hope have given you a clear idea of the lubrication theory, a clear understanding of the underpinnings of this theory and also how it can be applied to different types of problems. And you should now be in a position, for example, to use this theory to calculate pressure driven flow uh, through a wavy wall channel, uh, a problem similar to what we had considered earlier, except earlier we considered small amplitude waves. Here we can consider la large amplitude waves or I mean arbitrary amplitude waves, but where the wavelength of those waves are long. In that case, you have an imposed pressure gradient G. Uh, the walls, however, are non-moving, right? V and U would be zero. But you can then apply equations to calculate the uh, uh, varying uh, flow field in the X direction and also obtain the varying uh, pressure distribution inside such a channel. Uh, in that problem, a nice thing to calculate would be to understand how the flow field varies. So in these problems, we only consider the pressure and didn't bother much with the flow field. In the flow between a wavy channel, the objective would be to try and use the waviness of the wall to induce mixing. So in that case, it's useful to study the, uh, the uh, circulations that might develop as you force fluid through a, a long wave uh, channel. Uh, but that's a problem that I leave uh, uh, to you to take up as a personal project. Okay, so with that, I thank you for your attention. This brings us to the end of our uh, consideration of the lubrication approximation, the long wave approximation or the thin gap uh, procedure. Thank you.